The two-sector circular flow is useful for showing the basic construction of an economy, but it's not as precise a representation of a real economy as we would like. So, for the most part, the four-sector circular flow is going to be more useful to you. This can also be referred to as the open model of the circular flow, but for the most part, we'll just refer to it as the four-sector circular flow. It's open because now the households and firms have other players um, to which money can go or from which money can come into the circular flow. So let's start with what we use uh, with the two-sector circular flow and just see how it relates to this. We still have households and firms, but instead of looking at their expenditure, C, along with the goods and services as a flow coming back, we've just reduced that and we're only talking about the money, the expenditure, from households to firms. Likewise, instead of looking at the income in return for the factors of production, that's been condensed and that's income there. So this is the goods and services market and this is the uh, resource market here. When we talk about the four sector circular flow, what we're talking about is this idea that the income that households get won't necessarily equal the expenditure that the households have to firms. So let's make an example. Let's say the households in this economy, and there's multiple households in the economy, let's say they have an income of $1,000. Well, not all thousand of dollars of this income is going to then return to firms in the circular flow. Keep in mind, there's multiple firms in this economy as well. So let's say that of the thousand that comes in as income, only 700 ends up back with the firms. So we have to ask, where did that $300 go? Well, these are what we call our leakages. Sometimes uh, they're called leakages, other times other books might call them a withdrawal. Um, both are acceptable terms, whichever one you prefer. If, a household had a, if the households have $1,000, Maybe they've chosen not to spend some of it, and instead they're just going to save it. This is part of what we call the financial sector. Another thing they can do with their money, unfortunately they usually have to do with their money, is they have to pay a certain amount of tax. So because the government isn't a firm and it's not a household, it's something different. Again, this is a leakage. It's money that is being removed from the circular flow. Taxes, of course, are part of what we call the government sector. The third leakage is we can buy goods and services from other countries and the money, this is what's confusing about this because if you think about the good and the service, the good and service is coming in, but of course we're talking about the circular flow of money. So the money is leaving one country, leaving this country and going into a different country. So again, the money lost due to imports is a leakage from the circular flow. And of course, this is what we call part of the foreign sector. The other part of this, of course, is that for every, uh, for every leakage that we have down here, we have a corresponding injection, that is money that comes into the circular flow that isn't the responsibility of a firm paying a household. So for example, if a bank where you're saving your money decides we're going to give money to another person to help them start a business. That's what we call investment, and that's seen as an injection into the circular flow. When the government spends money to pay uh, teachers or to build roads or um, to pay politicians, again, those people in their private lives are households. That money's going to turn into expenditure, so it's an injection into the circular flow. Likewise, when people from other countries are buying your goods and services, that money comes into the circular flow that we're concerned with. So what's hard about this, or what's complex about this, is with the two-sector circular flow, you can see a lot of balance. And unfortunately here, the level of that balance isn't going to be the same. Yes, there's going to be some balancing between leakages and injections, some would argue that all the leakages put together would uh, equal all of the injections put together. But no one would ever suggest that, that the amount of savings that goes into banks equals the amount of investment that comes out of them. By the way, when I say banks, 
I mean the whole financial sector, which is more complex than just FNB or Bank of America or somebody like that. Likewise, governments tend to spend a whole lot more money than they bring in in tax. That's why we have national debts and government deficits. Um, and again, there's no reason to believe that a country's imports will be equal to their exports. That's why we have balance of, uh, balance of trade problems, current account problems, and issues like that. So it's not as nice and neat and tidy, but it is a more accurate model of what a country's economy might actually look like. Okay, one last note. You'll notice I have lots of things in parentheses or just shorthand. It is very common, especially in macroeconomics, to use just abbreviations because we have so many terms that we're talking about. Um, that goes back to that complexity that we've talked about in class. So these tend to be the standard ones that we use. Y is for income, just like in micro, remember YED was income elasticity of demand. C is consumption. Uh, investment would be I. Savings would be S. Government is, government spending is G, and taxing is of course T. Imports, we can't use I anymore because we already used it for investment. So imports is for, is M. And we don't use E for exports, probably just because it's not cool. Um, but it's used in other cases like equilibrium and things like that as well. So you do have to get used to the shorthand a little bit, um, but that just kind of comes with the territory.